Hello, welcome to Access to Justice. I'm your host, Heather Malarick of Merrick Law. I'm here with my co-host today, Evan Clark of Kahane Law, and we are joined by a very special guest, Kim McDonald of McDonald Advisory. Kim's a financial advisor and insurance advisor with Raymond James, LTD. How are you both doing today, Evan and Kim? I'm doing good. Uh... I haven't been th- through what Kim's been through the last little while, but uh, I'm doing all right. <laughs> we don't we don't need all the organs in our body, and then some can just we just need to get rid of them. So I was happy to go under the knife and in the fourth wave of the pandemic, and uh, the hospital was a zoo, but we got the job done, and I'm excited to be back on the program today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Yeah, we've had a bit of a filming furlough and missed our buddy Kim, but we're happy to see you back here healthy and smiling and looking well. So (laughs) welcome back. Filming Uh, furlough. That's like, did you just think of that off the top of your head, Heather? That was great. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Filming furlough. (laughs) Oh, Access to Justice is a Canadian podcast with a mission to educate Canadians about the law. We interview experts in law, mental health, and finance, focusing on topics that create the greatest barriers of, sorry, to entry into the justice system. You can find us on our YouTube channel, on our A2J podcast channel, and online at a2jpodcast.com. Um, so now that we've got sort of those preliminaries out of the way, I am very excited to be welcoming our guest today. Um, he's been practicing out of Creekside, or he practices out of Creekside uh, Psychology Resolution Services. He's been a registered psychologist for 35 years and has been working in the area of separation and divorce since the beginning of his career and has specialized in that area for the last 15 years. Um, I am happy and excited to introduce Dr. Greg Pickering. Hi, Dr. Pickering. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well, Heather. I think better than Kim, it sounds like. <laughs> no, Kim's doing great. She was not doing great. Oh, okay. She shed an organ or two. Okay. Or three. Okay. And now she's lighter and feeling fantastic. Much better than energy. what she was doing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm glad that that went well, Kim. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, I was hoping the surgeons would take off my my braces, but they they left them on, if you can believe it. So we're, we're doing okay. Uh, it could be better, but uh, Greg, we are really excited to have you on the program today because you are really good at what you do. And uh, I think our audience is going to be quite interested to hear what you have to say. Well, thanks very much. It's really good to be here. It's been a long time coming to get this organized. So it's great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, we're so pleased to have you here. So I think Evan and I actually have tried to have a conversation in the past about parenting coordination. And frankly, I think we mucked it up a little bit. Even as lawyers, I think there's maybe some, um, sometimes some misunderstanding or confusion about what parenting coordination is. So maybe we can start there. Could you tell us a little bit about what a parenting coordinator is and what they do? Yeah, well, Thanks. I, I think what I want to say, first of all, is um, there. if there is confusion, it's because there is so much variety in what uh, parenting coordination means um, across probably the Western world. I, I, I know more about um, North America, so the U.S. and Canada. And, um, you know, there's big differences in terms of the jurisdiction and I would have to say that there's also big differences in the way that um, individual parenting coordinators practice. So I think it it bears saying right at the get-go that um, I'll be talking about what I do as a parenting coordinator. And I I don't, I I know that other people practice very differently. Uh, One example of that is that um, Matthew Sullivan, who is um, the past president of AFCC, which is the Association of Family and Conciliation Courts, uh, came and presented to AFCC Alberta um, just before, yes, just before COVID hit. And he did a presentation on parenting coordination and 
I chatted with him at one of the breaks and I, I said to him, my goodness, what you and I do couldn't be more different. Um, it, it was just quite astounding to, to hear the differences between the two. So it already reinforced what I, what I know that it, it's very different depending on jurisdictions and depending on the individuals that are practicing it. So back to more specifically to your question, Heather, um, Parity coordination um, was designed to try and get people out of ongoing litigation in family court matters. So it was for um, families um, and parents that were either going through separation and divorce or had been through separation and divorce and were continuing to have um, lots of problems in, in which they were you know, calling their lawyers repeatedly, going to court repeatedly. And it really um, was to do with things that, that I think the court system was really never designed to deal with on an ongoing basis. Um, so it started about uh, in the late 80s, early 90s in two separate locations. One was in the, the Bay Area of San Francisco and one was in Colorado. And it was... Um, basically a group of family lawyers and um, um, family court ju judges or justices and uh, mental health professionals who worked in the area of separation and divorce. And they came up with this idea of, of maybe we, if we all work together, we could you know, find a, a different way of, of these high-flying litigants, as they're known, um, who actually got better at litigation as they, you know, got into the system and, and um, you know, really uh, got better at, at the litigation. So th that was the start of it. Um, and then, um, then it uh, sort of expanded. It was, again, when AFCC put together two um, task forces. I think that was in around 2003, and then AFCC came up with um, a set of guidelines for parenting coordination, and uh, those were redone in 2019. And so it lays out um, in some detail what parenting coordination is and what the training is that you should have for it. Um, what, what, the way I describe it um, to clients is that it's um, where um, I'm working with both parents I um, usually don't ever see the children, um, so it's most of the work is with the, the parents. And I am wearing three hats. One is as a, um, a coach and an advisor about a variety of issues, such as um, conflict resolution, communication, uh, child development, family systems functioning, so that's the first hat that I wear. The second one is mediation, and that's helping the parents uh, come to agreements about day-to-day -day parenting matters. And then the final um, hat that is usually uh, included in parenting coordination is there's some decision-making role that parenting coordinators have. Um, I, uh, I often thought, um, initially that that was really what defined parent coordination was to have that decision-making role. Mm -hmm. But as it's practiced and, and continued to practice, that's not always the case, not only in Alberta, but um, in the rest of the, the world as well. It can be, uh, um, parent coordination can just be those first two hats or two roles. Um, but I think it's more typically where there is a decision-making role as well. So I'll stop there and, and see if uh, there's <laughs> questions, other questions. That was a lot of information. No, well, like like Heather said, we've talked about this before, and uh, like I'm really looking forward to this because there it is kind of a mystery, like she said. And so you're already demystifying it, which is helpful. And um, you provided us with a a PowerPoint presentation. Are, are you okay if we post that so that people can access it when they listen to this podcast? I would you don't have to. to. That's why I'm yeah. asking. I'd like to make a, a change to the title page and to actually the, the last page where it was a presentation by a family lawyer in Edmonton that you probably all three know and myself. Um, 
And um, so I think just just the title page should be changed probably before you post it. Okay, great. So you'll make those changes and then we can post it because I think that'll be helpful for people to look through because it's like a great high level overview. Um, and one of the things, I, I have a question, but uh, Heather was about to speak and I jumped in. So I want to hear what Heather has to say first. Um, well, my question was in that third role, that sort of decision-making piece that is, I guess, optional, I guess, or doesn't always go along. Is that, I guess, similar to an arbitration kind of role? We've, we've spoken about arbitration on the podcast before. Yeah, yeah that's a good question. So um, in some jurisdictions, there is um, either state or provincial um, statutes that govern parenting coordination. So in, in those um, jurisdictions, I don't believe they have to use an arbitration act uh, um, as we do in Alberta. So the only jurisdiction in, in uh, Canada that has legislation is BC. There's um, Alberta and uh, Ontario that do have parenting coordination. And I believe, I just heard this recently, PEI as well, but those three provinces uh, do not have any legislation that governs parenting coordination. So in Alberta, um, I think that's what most parenting coordinators are using is either arbitration-like processes or the Arbitration um, Act itself. So for myself, again, this is, this is Greg Pickering's version of parenting coordination. I always am using arb the Arbitration Act when I'm making um any decision of any importance whatsoever if it's something very small um, um I'm, I'm working also under a court order i insist upon that in 98 percent of the cases and so in that case um the court order says that i have to at minimum uh you know talk to the people via phone um and i'm usually doing quite a bit more than that it'll be in a face-to-face -face meeting um, so yes, I'm, I'm using the arbitration act and arbitration processes for decisions of, of any magnitude. So that would be things like, um, um, parenting time arrangement, um, which, you know, is, is quite an onerous decision I think to be making. And I want to make sure that I'm, I'm following a, an arbitration, a formal arbitration process in order to make that. Okay. And so when people, when a family is coming to you for um, parenting coordination, um, they're, all, all three of you, I'm assuming, are having a conversation then about what kinds of things, topics you're going to uh, be assisting them with. And then if, if they can't reach resolution, what you will be deciding for them. Is that right? Yeah, so in the setup, maybe I should talk about the setup of, sure, yeah, of a typical great. file. Mm -hmm. um, so my, I'm usually approached by a family lawyer, and my usual process is to have a three-way teleconference call just with the lawyers to discuss the, the possible referral, and that's often very brief, um, and we can decide whether we're going ahead or not. And if we're going to go ahead, then what I like to have is a five-way teleconference call with the two lawyers and the two parents. And we, we talk just as we are probably in this podcast about the various issues um, that, you know, that need to be discussed, but also about the process in some detail. And I think that first phone call um, earlier on when I was doing this and I, and I missed that step, I, re I regretted doing it because people were not informed um, at the get-go. And so um, mm -hmm. really, in my view, that's an important step. And it, it talks about process and, and uh, how it's uh, paid for, the, the real details of, of the file itself, as well as the, you know, how the process goes and I'll get into that in a minute. Okay. Um, so after that meeting, then um, usually there is a court order um, that's prepared. So up until 2019, parenting coordination was covered under practice note seven in Alberta. 
And then as you probably are aware, it was taken out of um, practice number seven for a variety of issues, uh, reasons that we, we don't have enough time to get into. Um, but I still insist on a, um, a court order, uh, a, um, uh, an, a, an agreement, uh, a consent order, and um, there, most of the justices, um, all of my files are through Court of Queen's Bench, and most of the justices are signing those consent orders. Um, there's really only one or two that, that disagree with um, um, parenting coordination being under a court order, but generally there's a, a consent order. And um, once that's sent, um, sent off for signature um, and before COVID for filing as well, um, then, and the order was sent back to me, then I have a fairly extensive um, parenting coordination agreement that's sent out to the lawyers for their client signatures. And I also like to have a ILA, an independent legal advice form that's sent for the lawyers to um, fill out and, and send back to me. And then when that's when that that paperwork is sent back to me, then I set up the appointments. Um, one of the things that I, I like to describe in the five way meeting and for here in the podcast is um, I generally set up the files so that I have a small retainer fund and I usually ask for about $1,000, well, $1,000 from each parent. And that retainer fund is only for my admin time. And so administration time is obviously, you know, um, doing emails from the clients or the lawyers, although we usually don't have a lot of contact with lawyers after setup. Um, and um, phone calls and um, writing up notes. Um, and emailing those notes out. So those, those are what come out of the retainer. And then I ask for the, um, the clients to have a um, charge card that's put on file. And the day that we have meetings is when that um, charge card is, is charged and they get a receipt sent out. Mm -hmm. Usually everything electronic these days is sent out to the clients. So that's sort of the money end of things. And then we set a, then we, um, I have an, an initial um, either one and a half hour, usually one and a half hour intake meeting with each um, with each parent. And I have a, a whole um, list of topics that I like to get through background information, um, everything from, you know, um, the relationship dynamics, uh, why they separated divorce, um, you know, the level of conflict, um, that has um, occurred between the two of them, which in some cases can be very high. I'm obviously doing screening for safety issues. If there's been um, um, any type of domestic violence of any kind, um, finding out about the children and any concerns that the parents have about the children, and basically just getting a, a very good you know, background history from them. So I have a better understanding of what, um, you know, what, what the dynamics have been um, and also getting them to talk to me about what their goals are for the process in and of itself. Um, and then after the initial intake um, interviews, then we start a series of meetings and their conjoint meetings between the two co-parents and myself. And in the first meeting, I'm going over, I probably talk for the first hour um, and I'm talking, um, I'm trying to set the groundwork for the, um, the, the, the whole work. And really what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to shift people's mindset from, mindset from conflict and litigation to a collaborative and cooperative mindset. So I'm, I'm talking about that with them. And that's the, one of the overarching goals that I have for everybody that, um, that I start with in terms of parenting coordination. And I'm also talking a little bit about the history of parenting coordination, because I think it's important for them to know that. I talk a little bit about where we're at in this point in time where, um, in history, where 
you know, it, it's expected um, for most parents that are getting separated and divorced that they learn how to work together for the benefit of the children. Right. And most most people don't know that. And you know, this is really new in in the in in the course of history that parents have now got to really try to work together if at all possible. Um, and I'm setting up some rules for the meetings um, and um, how we're going to conduct ourselves in the meeting. Uh, it has to be a psychologically safe space for everybody to, to um, have the meetings. I, I talk about um, what mediation is and isn't. That's probably the bulk of what they're doing. So I do a little bit of coaching about that. I find people don't usually know what mediation is. They don't know how to make proposals. They don't know how to respond to proposals. So I'm, I'm providing a bit of education about that. And then we start getting into the issues that have either been um, uh, set out in their goals when they told me what their goals are, or more typically, we're starting working on a parenting plan. And I'll stop there because there's, there's things that I want to stop say about that and the parenting coordination process, but maybe you know you guys want to have a, a word first of all. <laughs> Again, I've talked for a long time. Uh, I have a follow up on. You said you screen for safety issues. So if there's, uh, I'm assuming you're looking for a history of domestic violence, things like that. Are there any sort of um, no goes, I guess, for you, or any issues that would make a family or uh, uh, some parents um, that would make parenting coordination inappropriate or maybe not the best process for a certain family or situation? Yeah, that's a good question again. You know, I think if there's um, um, an EPO or a protection order that doesn't allow the parents to be in the same room or to have no contact with each other at all. That's not a good, <laughs> I mean, um, before COVID, uh, the meetings were in my office. And so, um, you know, the parents were expected to show up together. And if there's safety issues about coming to the office and um, leaving the office, you know, together and being in the same vicinity with each other, you know, obviously not, not safe to do that. Um, so it's, it's really finding out what the level of safety issues uh, are in place and the level of comfort that um, each of the, the partners has. There are, um, there's been some cases that I've had where there has been a new contact order that has been uh, dispensed with just for the parenting coordination process. Mm -hmm. So that's been helpful. And then actually one, one of the few good things coming out of COVID is uh, these meetings that we're doing like this and, and all of my parenting coordination meetings are now online. And I think um, people are finding a lot more comfort with that. And um, not to say that there's high safety issues with most couples, but they're finding they don't have to sit in the same room with each other. And, and um, so that, that's working out really well. So back to, you know, your question, I think it's, it's just really finding out whether it's possible to even have contact with each other, right. if it's possible to have that dispensed with for the process. And then if it is to see what the level of safety is and comfort mm -hmm. is with each of them. And, you know, usually at that five-way meeting that I talked about earlier, those sorts of issues are going to be, you know, while well, I ask about them, if there's, you know, any of those issues in place and level of comfort. So we don't, right. usually don't have those um, surprise me when I get to the individual intake interviews. Right. So a follow, on, a follow on to that question was actually the question that I've been sitting on for a while, which is, okay, you've covered now, like, who is not suitable, which is very narrow, by the way. So if there's an EPO or emergency protection order or some other restraining order where people can't can't be in touch with each other unless they're um, they're allowed to for the purpose of parenting coordination, participating in, in your services, which by the way, I think, uh, and, and Heather, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think that's fairly common that the court will gladly put in an exception for this. So even if there is an EPO or protection order in place, um, I don't think it would be very complicated to get an exception for the court to update that order with an exception for the purpose of doing parenting coordination if they wanted to. So, um, 
then who's like the ideal or, or who is parenting coordinating good for? Yeah, it's a really good question, Evan. Uh, <laughs> you learn things as you go, as you, as you folks know, and I, the common wisdom, I think, in parenting coordination that's talked about by most people is the, the sooner you get people into the process, the better the sooner that they're not, you know, haven't learned how to be the so-called high-flying litigants um, is, is better. So people that are just starting off on this process, if they can get involved in parenting coordination has been traditionally seen as, um, as, as better. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'm not so sure based on my um, experience whether that is the case, and it's a sort of a sad testament or a sad state of affairs um, in terms of what I'm about to say, but I think I've noticed that people are, that are really well suited to parenting coordination are people that have been involved in a high conflict uh, situation for quite some time, and they are absolutely um, tired of the wars and worn out and are looking for another way to um, manage their co-parenting um, situation with each other and are looking for ways to shield their children from the ongoing conflict that, um, that the children have been subject to. So unfortunately, I think those are the best ones um, because they see how the court system and ongoing litigation is not, was never designed for what they're dealing with and um, has been very unsuccessful in helping them. So th that's my answer, Evan. Okay. So, pe so people that, uh, I like your term high-flying litigants. So for anyone that doesn't know, a litigant is somebody that participates in litigation, which is a, just a fancy way of saying, going to court and suing each other. And which is what you do in family law. You're, you, we don't usually talk about it like suing each other, but that's what a litigant is. Um, so anyone who's been embroiled in that long enough to be broken by the process is perfect for parenting coordination. Yeah, no, maybe not broken, Evan, but certainly okay. worn down, more, you know, yeah. battle, battle weary. <laughs> really. it, and it is, it is wearing and it is, it is exhausting. It doesn't take long to discover that court, uh, is not the best instrument for resolving family conflicts or conflicts around the relationship breakdown. It's, uh, it's a hammer and uh when all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail right and but a hammer is not always the best tool for family especially involving um to children and parenting um so those are ones that you've seen success with have you do you have any good success stories with people well you mentioned at the beginning that the common the conventional wisdom is uh, if you raise a child up when they are young, then they don't stray far from it when they're older. Uh, in other words, if right as they're starting the litigation or right as they're starting the relationships just breaking down, then that's a good time to start with parenting, uh, a parent coordination. But um, you're saying you seem kind of hesitant about that. Well, I, I wouldn't say um, not to do that. You know, I think, I think it, it, it's great to do that. Um, as well, so that they don't get, you know, in, into the trenches. Let's continue the metaphor, the war metaphor. Um, but but I, I have found that people that that are getting into it early, they often don't. Um, they're doubting the process maybe a little bit more because they don't know what the other um, less attractive options yeah. are. And, and so, you know, I, I, I thought more than once, so, oh, well, you know, you, and I, and I do say to the clients, you, you don't know what that other process is like that you're, you know, that you're contemplating. You don't like my decision, but let me tell you, if you end this process and go into another, you know, another process, you're, I think you're probably going to like that less, but I, I, I still think that it's great to get people into this as early as possible. Yeah. You know, I, I've experienced the same. I think Heather, you you have as well with, with our clients, which is sometimes if I'm the first lawyer they're seeing, they don't necessarily recognize the things about my practice that, you know, in my opinion, are the competitive advantages that I have. Some of my 
some of the clients that appreciate me the most have had a horror experience with some other lawyer first. And then they're like, oh, you're so much better. Um, there's lots of good lawyers out there. It's not always that way. But those, those sometimes when they've experienced kind of a, when they've had a bad experience with it, then they appreciate what I bring to the table. Whereas sometimes if I'm the first lawyer, they may be a little more um, slow to listen to my advice about avoiding litigation, for example, or taking a stance that's a little softer so that we can negotiate a result and make, you know, have some give and take. Um, they might be more prone to thinking litigation is the right answer, um, which I think kind of sounds like what you've, you're experience, you have experienced as well. Sounds, sounds very similar, Evan, yeah, for sure. So are, are there any other, um, any other kind of trends that you see in successful, in the files that you're having a lot of good success with? Do you see any other trends ex excluding for now the ones that have already been burned by court? Um, well, I think it, it's just... Um, People that are that are you know wanting to, really wanting to find a different way, and I think are really able to um, accept the counsel and the coaching that that I'm providing, and really able to put their children first. Um, and not everybody can do that. They they can say that that's their first goal, but um, they're you know, emotional wounds from the, from the breakdown of their marriage and the, um, you know, the ongoing wounds from the separation and divorce process sometimes are much stronger than the love they have for their children, um, quite sadly. But, um, you know, so if, if people can really, really keep the children first and really um, accept, I guess, my role as somebody who's uh, in a caring position, in a helping position, in a position to coach and guide them, and they can accept that coach, or, you know, coaching and guidance, then they're, they're great candidates for, for parenting coordination. And not everybody, not everybody is in that. There's lots of people, you know, especially in, as we all know, in the world of social media, where everybody's an expert with their Google Google Doc and Google PhDs and all of that, you know, I think Ooh. people that are educated are, are, are not as uh, esteemed, not as valued, not as, um, you know, listened to, I guess, as, as, as we used to be perhaps. In the well, the pandemic has taught us that, right? Like, I didn't know there were so many people that had so much expertise about vaccinations. Yeah, no, it's it's hard. It's out of the woodwork. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. let, I want to explore that for a second with the hopes of maybe convincing some people who might be kind of thinking about this as an option. Um, so you you do a lot of, would you say that you do a lot of uh, parent coordination work? Yep. So, so in my practice, um, probably 80% of my practice is separation and divorce work. The other 20% being a clinical practice, helping people with, you know, um, depression, anxiety, you know, a small, small number of things like that. Um, and so the rest of it is 80% is separation and divorce. And by far the, um, the largest percentage of that would be um, parenting coordination. Um, I, I don't I don't know if this is true, but I think I'm probably the busiest parenting coordinator in Alberta. And I, and I say that without any hubris or, you know, my head will still get through the door. Um, it's sort of in an unusual situation where in Calgary, there's a number of parenting coordinators. So they sort of, you know, share share the, the work that's there. And in, in Edmonton, there's only myself and another person. Uh, who do parenting coordination. There's other people that are trained in Edmonton, but they don't actually uh, work in the area. So, um, you know, I, I think I'm probably, and I, I'm sort of basing that I, I've presented for the last two years at the AFCC Alberta uh, conference on uh, parenting coordination. And so, I, you know, I've sort of gotten the sense that, that that's the case. And um, yeah, it's um, it's um, work that I, I, I'm very interested in doing it's not easy work i was i always say i was more happy to get my parenting coordinator designation than i was my phd um because it really was a goal that um that i 
um, strove for after working in the area. And that's a whole, I can talk to you about how I got into why I wanted to get into parent coordination, if you like, um, which is what I do with my clients as well. So they know, uh, again, how, how I got into it and why I'm interested in it. I need to get to know them, but they need to get to know me. And that's one of the benefits of the parenting coordination process as well, instead of, you know, having somebody who, uh, you know, Court of Queen's Bench Justice who, um, you know, because of the system doesn't ever really get to know. Yeah, hold on. you're gonna you're stealing my thunder a little bit. So I, I wanted to I wanted to like build up to then bringing that point home. So you, <laughs> what's your what's your professional training? Yeah, so so I have a Bachelor of Arts in. Um, yeah, me too. That's a great degree. I it's um, provided me with more um, life enrichment than anything else that I could do. I'm a big believer in a good old BA arts um, and they'll never get you a job or it won't get you very much of a job, but in terms of enriching my life, it's been awesome. Um, yeah, and then I have a master's in uh, counseling psychology. Um, both of those are degrees are from the U of A and then I did my PhD in Santa Barbara in clinical psychology. Um, and then this, this particular role, um, actually any psychologist that is working in the area of separation and divorce, there, there is no um, uh, post-secondary program that's going to prepare you for specializing in separation and divorce. Um, so, you know, that, that's a whole lot of training. And that's probably true of a lot of specialty areas, but I certainly know this one. So mediation training. Um, I have uh, arbitration uh, courses. I've taken some of those. Then there was a parenting coordination training that um, was um, taught for a number of years by a retired judge in Alberta. It was awesome, awesome training um, in and of itself. I'm so thankful for getting that training. Um, and then for all of the different pieces that I do in the separation and divorce area other than parenting coordination there's you know training specialized training in that the collaborative family law area obviously um so i was one of the original uh um seven people in edmonton that were trained in collaborative law about i don't know 22 years ago i think it was that we were all um all doing that training together so those are some bits and pieces of, of the training that i have yeah, and and like you just said, you you did the collaborative law training twenty two years ago. You you have plenty of experience applying that tr that training that you've received. And I know um, parenting coordinators are individuals; they're different people. They're going to have their own backgrounds and training, but they all have training and some specialization in dealing with this and coming at it from the perspective of. Um, I don't know if they're all psychologists, but certainly coming at it from that type of a perspective of trying to help people resolve these issues as opposed to the legal training side of the house. And um, I, because the emotions and the legal, and the, the legal issues are always tied up. And um, Heather and I have talked about, mentioned this a few times of how, you know, we have, sometimes we have to say like, you know, that's, that, that is not a legal problem. I can't help you with that. I mean, I could, but I'm not very good. I'm not a good psychologist. I've never been trained that way. <laughs> um, but so there's, there's one option. You get help with a parenting coordinator and we'll get more into uh, what that looks like where you, you can help them make decisions, help them come to their own, make decisions together, or uh, you can also make decisions for them to a certain point. And that's your background, and that's what you bring to those decisions. Then, on the other hand, you have a court at provincial court, uh, you have a judge at provincial court or a judge at Queen's Bench, who um, has little to no training about psychology, may have, has lots of experience working in the law, may or may not have very much experience with family law, just because they're, they're a judge doesn't mean they practice as a family law lawyer. They could have done something else. The judges um, decide lots of different types of cases. Generally, they have access to a very limited amount of information that they hear in a very limited period of time. And then they make a decision that is legally binding that you've now got to live with. 
Uh, Kim, we haven't heard from you yet. Which scenario sounds better? <laughs> Well, I think we'll leave it to the professional to answer this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's go back a little bit, Evan. This is a great topic to get into. So parity coordinators have, have typically been either mental health professionals and usually somebody with a PhD um, in, in psychology. Uh, we forget in Alberta that um, we're the only jurisdiction in North America now where you can be registered as a psychologist with a master's degree in psychology. There isn't any other jurisdiction that I know of um, where that's the case. Um, so usually it's a PhD in psychology and or it's a lawyer who has decided to get the specialized training and go into parenting coordination. And I, you know, it's both what the, there's not a lot of research on this, but what the research shows is that um, each of the disciplines have their strengths and weaknesses. And so what, what the strengths are of the psychologists are that they do have that background um, in, you know, child development and, and family systems um, training and education and uh, communication skills training and conflict management, you know, and what their weaknesses are is that they often spend too far too long in trying to mediate and have people come to agreement instead of saying nonsense, we're done here. Now it's time to move to the, you know, mm -hmm. to the arbitration phase and the decision making phase. Mm -hmm. And conversely, lawyers, you know, are and this is research. This isn't me saying this. And there's not a lot of research, but there, but there is this this um, uh, research that that looks pretty um, convincing, and certainly is something that also those of us who practice from different disciplines and talk about it, we can see how this this is true from our own perspective. So lawyers are much better at making the decision and stepping in and being uh, a bit more directive. Um, and of course, then they've got the the legal you know, background about process and, and um, you know, they can't advise anybody because they're not lawyers, but they can talk to people when they have strange ideas about, you know, what trotting off to court is going to do or not do for somebody. Um, but then they're, they're maybe not as good about the, um, the mental health side of things. Um, so I, I, I saw that in my own training when I was there, there was um um, lawyers, um, well, a mixture of mental health professionals um, and the uh, lawyers who are both from Calgary and from BC. And it was really interesting to see in the training just how the two disciplines would go about, um, you know, working on, that, on uh, a similar issue. So, you know, I think it's great. Um, BC, unfortunately, is almost all of the parenting coordinators there are lawyers. Um, I think that's unfortunate. Um, and in Alberta, almost all of the parenting coordinators are mental health professionals. And I think that's unfortunate. I, one of the reasons I love AFCC is because of the multidisciplinary um, approach, the foundations of that whole organization. And we can learn from each other um, profoundly and, and talk to each other. And so I, I think it's great that, that both disciplines are involved in it and both have their weaknesses and their strengths. Yeah, and I, and like I know I kind of made a strong case that oh everyone should be doing parenting coordination, and, and that's not true. It's not it, you don't not everyone necessarily needs parenting coordination to come to a good result, and of course parenting coordinators are not perfect and are not is not there's no like magic bullet that I've ever come across when it comes to deciding parenting issues, um, but I think most of the time there's just. There are just plenty of resources out there that are going to be better than than heading to court most of the time. And parenting coordinating coordination, I think, is is a great one. Heather, I think you uh, I think you have something to say. Uh, you know, I wanted to highlight um, actually some words that were from Dr. Pickering's presentation that he provided to us, and I I, I jotted them down in my preparation for today's discussion. Um, that there's a poor fit between the adversarial system and the resolution of ongoing parental conflict. And, 
You know, that got me thinking in so many ways, because I think that's kind of the nub of it in some ways is the legal system and lawyers are pretty good at, at feeding a question in and maybe churning it with the facts and saying, okay, we think this is what might happen or, or the legal system's good at giving a decision of that. But if the goal is to resolve the ongoing parenting conflict and give families tools to make those decisions for themselves going forward. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that the parenting coordination route is kind of a no brainer where you can get the support to learn those communication skills to keep the children at the forefront and, and in the center of the considerations and all of those kinds of things. So I just wanted to add that because there was something that was kind of um, churning for me in, in, in preparing for this and thinking about the processes. That's such a good point, Heather, because uh, like, yes, the courts will get you an answer. But what you're talking about is, well, what about the tools to, like to help you kind of work through this ongoing situation? Because the court will say, OK, here's the parenting order. But usually not everyone's super pumped about the parenting order. And then there's a lot of communication that has to happen, no matter what the parenting order is, to make it work. And the court is not it's not interested in giving anybody tools for, you know, like real helpful tools to communicate. Like we do our best. We have some resources that we can provide, but that's not, that's not the court's area of expertise. Okay. I'm going to jump in here. I've got, uh, I've got some clarification. I think that the everyday person might need. All right. So, so there's a little bit of a chicken and an egg scenario here where when it comes to thinking about therapy versus parenting coordination. And I'm, I think there's probably people out there saying, well, I don't want to do parenting coordination because you know, my ex needs therapy. We're never going to be able to work through anything, but parent, parenting coordination is not therapy. We know that from your notes, Greg. So, so I'm trying to figure out, you know, how, how do people know what route to go? I mean, maybe there is no bad choice. You, you, you start off with parenting coordination and figure out you're, you're stuck and whatnot. And, and then you go to therapy or how, like, what do you bump into in that scenario? Well, I think, I think it's a really, really good question. And, and um, you know, I, I state in that first meeting where I'm laying the foundation and talking about the history and FPC and mediation, what it is and isn't. And I'm also talking about how um, this is not therapy. And this is about learning how to be good co-parents with each other. And... Um, what I haven't said so far, and which I think is key, is that um, I'm, while parenting coordination was supposed to be designed for what um, in the literature is called post-adjudication, so when there is a parenting time arrangement in place, as well as some rudimentary parenting plan in place, almost never in my work as a parenting coordination or coordinator has that been the case. Um, and so a lot of my initial work is working with the, um, the, the parents. Um, that's what happens after that first hour. And then we start getting into, you know, what their goals are. And these are issues of, of you know, between them that, that they haven't been able to agree on and have been in conf conflict about. But I tell them, you know, that just about everything that you are, are going to mention to me and your goals are going to be because you don't have a parenting, a very, I call detailed, comprehensive parenting plan in place. And so a lot of the initial work is getting, working with them to get a parenting plan in place. And what, what people don't seem to realize is that they they seem to need therapy and of course one of the the hallmarks of of high conflict people is they blame each other for the problems and they don't take any personal responsibility yeah. so we have to talk about that and identify their i do this all the time their conflict cycle but you know more than that when people are given structure which is a parenting plan a detailed comprehensive parenting plan and the coaching that goes along with that, which I'm providing on an ongoing basis, 
then what a lot of people that look like they are in need of therapy actually settle down and start to cooperate with each other and follow the black and white parenting plan that they now have in their hot little hands, mm -hmm. as well as the coaching and advising that I've provided has gone in and started to, you know, affect them so that they see there is a better way, a different way, a less, you know, conflictual way of doing this. And people that seem like they were very, um, you know, emotionally dysregulated and, um, you know, very uh, personality disordered people even, um, that's a big area in this whole area. Are these mm -hmm. people really personality disordered or are they going through one of the most difficult uh, phases of their life and they really don't look up again. They don't look like they're, you know, they're very doing very well. Um, but once they get some stability, they, they function much better individually and together. So I, I, um, I find that really the parenting coordination process does help people to really learn to settle down both internally and in terms of their relationship with each other and the, the goals of it, which is to learn how to, you know, lessen the conflict and increase communication. Um, those, those things happen um, in every file that, that I've had that, that's um, been successful. And um, mo most of the files that I work with, I would say have been successful. Um, so, you know, those are the reasons. And then people don't need any therapy um, yeah. because they're actually following the, the structure and the agreements that they've made and, and building some trust back in their relationship and some, um, you know, confidence that they can work together, which wasn't there previously at all. What would be typical issues that people would come to you for? Oh, you know, everything from, um, I, I, I will say this, um, I have taken on as I've gotten more confident um, I've taken on making um, decisions um, about parenting time. So, so the whole custody and access, um, which wasn't originally thought to be part of the parenting coordination process, and I certainly didn't do that at the beginning. So everything from that to um, I want, you know, a child for two extra hours on Friday night and they can't agree <laughs> on that. Um, so those are the sort of decision-making um, things that I'm doing, but then everything in, in terms of what goes into having um, a good co-parenting relationship um, based on a parenting, a detailed comprehensive parenting plan. I, I keep using those two words because they are so important. Um, I'm helping them with every detail of that. Um, and one of the, you know, one of the, the, the dictums about this work um, and maybe your work is the higher the conflict, the more structure that's needed to be in place. Right. And so, you know, some some parents come or yeah, some parents come in with parenting coordination. They're really high, high, um, high conflicts. So we have to put in their their parenting plans are much much longer and much much more detailed. And other people are coming in and they're much less uh, conflict. So their parenting plans are much more simple. So it really depends on on the the two co parents about the, the level of um, complexity and detail that are in the parenting plan. But that, that's really what I'm working on. And then once that parenting plan is in place, then people are contacting me only when they, there's something new that comes up um, that they hadn't thought of, or one of them doesn't like what's in the parenting plan and they want to change it. Um, then, and they haven't been able to agree on that on their own, then they, then they uh, come to me. And there's, there's a structure that's set up about how they come to me. Now, I know we've talked about this before, and I think, Heather, we looked it up on, there was a website, a parenting coordination website or something. But I seem to recall there, we, we learned something about where the line is of what parenting coordinators, what decisions they can make, um, and what they can't. And so you are just talking about changing parenting time, where is that line of where you, where you can't, like, what are the decisions you can't make and what are the decisions you can make as the parenting coordinator? Well, I think, Evan, as I said, um, 
parenting coordination started off where the decisions about the parenting time, so custody and access, um, was decided by the courts and parenting coordinators were not to be involved in that. So this is across North America. And I think that a, a lot of parenting coordinators may very well still hold that line. I have, as I said, I have, with some persuasion by family lawyers that I know well and have had many files with and we work well together, so I know that they're not going to, you know, try to pull a fast one. And with their clients that say to me, we would rather have you decide this than a judge. Um, and you, we could sign just an arbitration agreement with you on this matter. But we want you to decide everything, including parenting time. I took the plunge and said, okay. <laughs> and um, I've done that now on a number of files. And um, it, it seems to work out well under those circumstances where people have more confidence in my ability to make such a decision um, as opposed to uh, a okay. judge. Yeah, that makes sense. So because, of course, um, well, I think arbitration is unregulated. There are, so it makes sense that of course, a parent, you could sign an arbitration agreement and have authority to make whatever decisions the parties agree on. Um, so that makes sense to me. The and, but it's not the case. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think what I'm hearing is it's not the case that you generally just act as a an arbitrator in general. But for situations where you are acting as a parenting coordinator, if they want to, uh, you to make that decision, then. Um, sometimes you will do an arbitration agreement and then make that decision for them. Whereas that's not necessarily common across the board for all parenting coordinators. No. And, and it would be set out at the beginning about what the scope of my authority is. So that's, that's in the court order that I asked for. Um, you know, it'll say in probably about two different ways, what the scope of my authority is and what it includes and what it doesn't include. But okay. What it include is, you know, any and all decisions about the the parenting time arrangement. So that can be a change of one hour, and it can be a change of really having um, one parent have primary custody of a child, and um, the other the other parent having a reduction in the in the time. To me, I think I just see that as so much more valuable than not having that uh, scope of authority. Because like if I have clients and I certainly have had clients where they just cannot, they just can't, they just can't work together and they're, they've got some kind of a uh, shared parenting arrangement of some kind, not necessarily 50, 50, but where there's back and forth and it's just the worst. And they just uh, suck towards each other. They're terrible to each other and can't just can't make it happen. And um, so to resolve something like that in court, cause it's like, it's like nonstop. There's always some little thing and to resolve these kinds of things in court is disproportionately expensive in time and money for them to do. Whereas to have somebody that's familiar with everything, familiar with them and familiar with the situation to be, then have the authority to also make tweaks or even dramatic changes to the parenting arrangement. That makes so much sense to me. I, uh, like to me, I see that as a very valuable um, tool in the toolbox. Well, I, I, I think so as well. But um, my training was was that, um, and I, <laughs> I'm forgetting what there's some um, uh, there's some some court law where the courts may not give their authority to change parenting time to anyone else. Um, and you folks would know what that is. It's a, a common principle or a point of law. You guys know what I'm talking about? Um, in any case, that was my training, but that's certainly not followed um, in practice. <laughs> so um, practically speaking, I am, I am, and other parent coordinators are being given that authority to do that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So this is part of the reason that I 
wanted to, you know, I said it was happy to get the designation of parent donation because my my experience was that I would be uh, before parent donation, I'd be working with family um, either under practice note seven or just people that came to me, and then you know they'd have a court application and and that would ramp up the conflict and the lack of you know lessen the trust and things would devolve quite significantly and either that was the end of my good work with them and the steps forward that we'd made or you know we'd have to start all over again so that's what why i was interested because i thought well if everything you know was under my umbrella <laughs> one one stop shopping type of things and, and they come to me for me to make that the decisions you know maybe there wouldn't be such difficulties and that's really borne out been borne out in in um, um, my my experience. I haven't had anybody formally challenge a decision that I've made, large or small. Mm -hmm. I've had clients that have been mad at me for making a decision, but they have faith in me and the process that they we carry on. I haven't had any clients who say they want to end the process because of the decision that I've made. And of course, I wouldn't allow that anyways. Um, but I have had people that have wanted to end the process after we've come to sort of a, you know, a, a common understanding that it's not working any longer, but that's a whole different topic altogether. So I, I think it really has worked um, about having this, you know, the three parts of this process and people accepting the decisions that I have to make. If it goes that way, obviously trying not to have it just me making decisions. I'm not that interested in just making decisions. Um, I, you know, I will when I have to, but I, I'm mostly trying to work with people that are, you know, wanting to basically change, as I said at the beginning from, you know, a, a different, a mindset, um, and also to, to have the practical tools so that they can, in a practical way, deal with each other in a more cooperative, collaborative way. And you, you mentioned a couple of times, sorry, Heather, you mentioned a couple of times practice note seven. And I was actually hoping Heather could give us a brief explanation of what that is. Oh, um, you're putting me on the spot here. Right. I've looked at right. it in a while. It's uh, the uh, an order that will allow various kinds of intervention with a family anywhere from sort of a I guess a, a triage sort of evaluation where someone might look at the family and give a recommendation of what process might work for them um, right up to sort of a more evaluative um, process where the parents would work together with a therapist. I'm trying to think of what the other options under a practice no, sorry. are off the top yeah, of my head. Yeah, no, sorry. I wasn't <laughs> expecting you to have it like uh, memorized off the top of your head, Heather. I was just hoping you'd kind of explain the concept of what a practice note is and like why would be just, just for a little background, because, you know, we, there's a lot of little things that we say that, uh, right. you know, people don't know what we're talking about. Evan, I'd like to take a stab at that, okay? Sure. Well, this is what I tell clients because with informed consent, I've got to go over, you know, what what um, what my service agreement says. Um, I have to do that, and I say that for consumers of of legal um, services, there's all sorts of practice notes, and some have to do with criminal law, and some have to do with other types of law and some have to do with family law. And the two that have to do with family law are practice note eight, which are, you know, really intensive um, assessment, bilateral custody assessment. And then the other one is practice note seven. And practice note seven divides into two broad areas. One is assessment and one is intervention. And Heather, you said triage and voice of the child are the two main assessment uh, that fall under practice note seven. And then on the other side, the intervention that can be um, working with a family, working with one parent, working with one child, working with both parents, working with the family, um, the entire family, mediation, uh, family reunification um, files. And then practice note seven used to be under that side of of, uh, or parenting coordination used to be under that side of practice note seven. 
And so they're the hit to assist practice notes are orders to assist families that are going through separation and divorce or that are have gone through it and are still experiencing difficulties. Yeah, so practice notes are issued by the court and have to do with procedure. And there's actually 10 family law practice notes. Um, they all deal with various things and are meant to, they're, they're meant to provide guidance, but they're not actually orders. They're not, um, they're not the law. They're more like procedural guidelines. And in fact, I just read a case where somebody was appealing something because a practice note wasn't followed um, uh, to the letter and, and the court of appeal said, yeah, they don't have to be followed to the letter because they're just guidelines. The judges have authority to make decisions about them. But yeah, and there's a practice note, like you mentioned, practice note seven that deals with interventions in family law cases that can sometimes be helpful and necessary. So I just wanted to, yeah, let, help people know what practice notes are. There's, they're a boring, they're really boring, but the, now when people know what, what we're talking about, we say practice note seven. Okay, that, that took us probably longer than it needed to, but Heather, you were about to say something when I barged in with my practice note seven oh, background. I don't remember what it was, oh, I'm but it'll sorry. probably now come I back. Terrible. I think I was just going to say, actually, the thought that struck me was that I think that, um, uh, and this is for our listeners, is I think that um, what Dr. Pickering mentioned about the fact that people have lived with his decisions and haven't um, made efforts to overturn them in his, you know, in his career of making these types of decisions is, I, I mean, I can't overstate what a testament that is to the process, because I think that is, um, you know, it's a big reason for the revolving door in litigation is that people don't like the answer. So they go back and, and, and it keeps them in conflict all the time. So I think that <laughs> that statement in and of itself may not be, <laughs> oh, hopefully it's impactful um, to our listeners and is, is convincing that this really is an effective process in creating lasting change and, and change in dynamics and families for the better. Yeah, I like I uh, I can't agree more, Heather. I feel like this has been. I, have we had a parenting coordinator on before? No, no? he's you're our first. So, and I think I think it's been so helpful. Um, I already was aware of it as an asset that I would like my clients to use, but now from hearing what you said, uh, I just see it as that it can be used in more situations than I was thinking for. Like it can be more broadly applicable. Um, so I'm hoping, and one of the challenges is always just because it's a good tool that's out there doesn't mean people always want to use it, but at least, uh, now I think I'll be better educated when I'm presenting it as a tool to my clients that, that might help them. Yeah. And I, you know, I, I haven't done as many presentations, but when I, when I was, um, starting off with this, there was two other people that I was working with and, you know, <laughs> We, we went to the Court of Queen's bench um, justices twice and did uh, presentations there. And that was probably the most helpful thing to, to get them aware of what, you know, what's going on. And that's, I don't know, 10 years ago and eight years ago. And we all know how many new justices there are at the Court of Queen's bench. And, you know, it should probably go again and another presentation. Then we presented to uh, the provincial court judges um, and there wasn't a very good turnout for that. And I've been to the CBA family um, section, I don't know how many times to present and the, to the Edmonton Collaborative Group once. Um, and it, it, it's just because we're, you know, people are retiring and there's new people coming in all the time in, in all those areas. It's a, it's a matter of, um, you know, presenting uh, repeatedly so that people really do understand what it's about. And also, I guess, understand what it's about from how I work as well. And you're going to, you would hear, if you're going to have another parenting coordinator, you're going to hear, uh, you know, different things probably than, than what I've said today. But it, it's just an ongoing, um, I think, staying informed, you know, this this era area that we work in, but also this parenting coordination, because it it's also changing all the time and, and evolving. So I, you know, that's one of the reasons that I was happy to do this today is, is that it'll, you know, I haven't done a presentation for a while, so I think it'll 
you know, get more information out with a whole other group of people. Yeah. It sounds like we're kind of wrapping up, but oh, Kim, no, you, I have, you have not asked your question. I have, so I have lots of questions, actually. <laughs> so, okay. So there are people out there listening to this, and they've they've hit a barrier. So they're, they're hearing court order, court order. I can only get into a guy like Greg if I get a court order. Now, I'm sure there's people out there who don't know how to get a court order, or maybe they there's another way to get parenting coordination without a court order. Um, so can you speak to what that might look like, even for people who need a tune-up, you know, five years later, and they're just kind of having struggling with their parenting after divorce? What, what would you suggest those people do? So... Um... On a rare occasion, I have just, I've done parenting coordination with just my, my parenting coordination agreement, which is, I think, 15 pages long, something like that. And um, I really have to be talked into that um, as, as opposed to why not do uh, previously when it was under practice note seven and now just under a consent order, why not do that? It provides a whole, the orders, I believe, provide a whole another layer of um, gravitas, for lack of a better word. Um, and everything is laid out in those orders that are, there's drafts of them. It's not like it takes, you know, a lawyer a long time to draft the orders. They're there. The draft orders are there, plunk in the information, and then... All of the things about the process are laid out in terms of reporting, lack of confidentiality. Everything has been well thought out. It's there already. Why not do that as opposed to just my parenting coordination agreement? And then maybe the information that, that is there because of in, in the process is maybe lost if there is a return to litigation going forward if that makes sense. So what you're saying is people need to get this in order to see a parenting coordinator. I just believe that it, it is a much better way and it's not very onerous for people to do it. Even self-represented litigants can go to the practice note seven, the old one and download a draft form of the parenting coordination order and plunk in the details and send it off with filing. You know, it's a very simple process. Okay. Yeah. For, for non-lawyers and, and the everyday people, you know, it, it, it sounds cumbersome when we hear the words and we don't really know, okay, what, like, is this five hours of work and, and do I have to do it with my ex when they're not going to maybe want to do the homework with me? And how do we actually put this into play so we can get it to somebody who can help us? Yeah. I don't think I've ever had um, a file, parent coordination file where there's two self-represented litigants. Um, so it's usually the lawyer that's representing mom or dad that takes on uh, doing the order. Um, and so the self-represented um, parent doesn't have to deal with, with that. Okay. But yeah, I, I think you make a good point, Kim, is if, if you don't understand and, you know, and, and both of you are self-represented, you know, how do you go about it? Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I should say, though, is I require an ILA. So I'm saying to people, you're going to have to get a lawyer to set this up. You don't have to keep them, but you're going to get a lawyer. You need a lawyer to set this up and the costs to you are going to be minimal. And the advantages of that are, are pretty substantial. And what I explain to people is, you know, I make a decision and there's no ILA signed. And so the other parent says, oh, well, I didn't understand the process. And so, you know, I'm not going to follow the decision that Pickering made. Whereas if you've got a a court order and an ILA signed, you know, there, there's really no grounds for the other parent to say, I didn't understand what I was getting into. It just, it's that loophole. Gotcha. So would this be Evan and Heather? Is this, is this something you would suggest that people would go to a limited scope lawyer for to get this piece put in place? Or what, what do you guys see from your side of facilitating this? Yeah, that would certainly be something that um, I would and could help with for sure. And it, yeah, I don't, it wouldn't be very costly. Yeah, ILA stands for Independent Legal Advice. And um, yeah, for something like that, it doesn't have to be, especially if it's already prepared and the lawyer's just looking at it, it's a fairly straightforward thing. Um, most lawyers bill by the hour and it probably won't take too long to review that and provide that advice. 
Great. Now, on the budgeting side of things, which is where I like to insert myself in these uh, podcasts. So, Greg, I do budgeting with people, financial planning, and sometimes people have the money to do stuff like this. Sometimes they just don't. Um, but you uh, had laid out for us ahead of this podcast uh, some average costs that people could expect and, and maybe uh, some timelines on how long uh, you've seen these files, um, you know, last for. And uh, it sounds like uh, you've got the retainer. I, you didn't clarify if you bill by the hour, but I'm thinking that that's how this works. And, um, you know, what, what can people expect for, for costs? Uh, I think we had about 1850 to 4150 a year from your averages. Uh, but yeah, I want you to tell us exactly what that looks like. Yeah, good. Um, so um, I do bill by the hour and I bill $400 an hour and that's for both file administration and for any of the meeting times. So basically as lawyers bill, any time that you're spending, um, I'm, I'm billing the same way, obviously a full accounting of the time spent, um, on, and on any of my activities is available at any time. Um, and what, um, I don't know where those figures, Kim, that you quoted. Uh, well, I, I sort of, you know, I sort of did my own fancy footwork on them. So we had approximately from 2011 to 2015, your, your files had shown over a two-year term, uh, things costing about 3700 to 8300 on average. So I just chopped that in half for the year, tried to get a sense of what some <laughs> a couple might pay for a year of uh, services and um, yeah. I yeah. Good. I, I I forgot that that file was was in the PowerPoint. That I thought it was in another PowerPoint I have. So um, you can't really go by year because, um, for example, I have two files that have been open since I started this. So that's over ten years ago. Mm -hmm. And do I have very much to do with them? No. Um, maybe once a year when they get into a little bit of trouble, they um, you know, they, one of them contacts me and says, okay, we, you know, we met the criteria for contacting you. Um, we want you involved. And I send back an initial email and usually that's the end of it. And I think they're afraid of being billed $400 an hour for something that they've been very good at sorting themselves out for 10 years. And I never hear another word when I contact them annually and say, do you still want your file open? They say, oh, yeah, yeah, we, we want you there just in case. Okay, mm -hmm. That's one extreme. And then the others are um, after the initial work that I do. And, and it's, um, you know, the, the triangle where I'm doing a lot of work at the beginning and then less and less as time goes on. Um, you know, um, it can be that, that um, after the parenting plan is done and um, the coach, original coaching is done, um, that I'm involved for maybe uh, under a year, often often in the order and in the my parenting coordination agreement, the term is set out. It, you, that used to be very standard. Parenting coordination started off as a minimum two-year process. This is in internationally. In Alberta, it was started off, it seemed like more of a year process. It's more common now for there to be no term but practically speaking, after I would say a year or two at the most, um, the file is, is ended and it's closed and um, I don't hear from them again. Mm -hmm. The parenting plan and the, the services that I've provided seem to have provided them with enough to fly on their own instead of being high-flying litigants. Mm -hmm. I hope people in the financial services hear this because if they if they tell if they bake in these costs and and know the value of somebody like you, then people aren't going to not do it because of the money. So, like I, I really think it's important for for financial professionals to watch this podcast and position this properly. Not like, do you have the money? Okay, do this. It's like, you no, know, here's what it's going to cost. We're going to make you know changes in other areas so that way you can do this because it's really really valuable. There was one of the questions that specifically came up um, 
with the Court of Queen's Bench Justices. So remember, this is going back eight and ten years ago. And um, yeah, they really, really grilled us on what it cost. And you could see even with the answers that we provided, they really had concerns about it. And one of the justices said, oh, it, you know, it's like hiring a private judge, um, not, not thinking about the other pieces of the work. And he said, but you could get all that for free in the public system, right? And it's like, well, there's not much to argue against that, right? Um, but it is a concern for a lot of people. And um, I think also it, it is um, the case where often um, the parents still have lawyers that they're paying for the financial end of things because parenting coordination does not get into anything financial. Right. So, you know, that has to be taken into, into account just because they're not consulting with their family lawyers about the parenting end of things doesn't mean that they're not doing you know, dealing with some of the financial and the things, so there is that added cost there. But I, I think, I think overall, um, it is, yeah, a very cost-effective way of of proceeding, um, by and large. I'd like to think that line of thinking of, oh, it's your own private judge. You can get a judge for free. I like to think that line of thinking is disappearing. I hope it is, mm -hmm. especially because judges are so overworked. And so, um, yeah, you can get it for free, but time also has uh, cost and the time cost is extreme. And if it's a complex kind of situation, then it's got to go to special chambers uh, if it's in the Queen's bench level. And special chambers is expensive. You're paying your lawyer lots of money for that. Like uh, probably somewhere between seven and $10,000 in legal fees to go to special chambers. And that's each side. So now you're already at fourteen to twenty thousand dollars, but the judge is free, well, and it's going to take like six months. And your product is not going to be a. I'm going to try and remember your words, Dr. Pickering. A comprehensive and detailed parenting plan that meets the needs of that family on an ongoing basis. So yeah, I mean it's a it's a. I think it's a cost save. That's a cost savings fallacy <laughs> to yeah. think of it that way. I'd like to imagine too that if you're assisting a family in um, dealing with some of the conflicts on the parenting side, that that can make some of the financial stuff go a little more easily as well, because you're improving communication. You're helping with some of maybe those log jams that are are happening between the couple in in the uh, or the formal couple in their personal dynamics that would just help things along on that other side of things as well so yeah well they're they're getting a little bit of learning out of fish aren't they like um they're they're learning skills like not everybody is just born with good communication skills and part of what i'm hearing you say is that you're coaching them you're teaching them skills of how to work with each other and communicate you don't learn you don't get that at special chambers that's for sure yeah and sometimes so i'm i'm in contact with the lawyers to see if i can you know nudge them into getting the financial things um settled because they they do they do tend to affect the work that I'm doing. Yeah. Um, and so that's, that's usually um, well received by the lawyers when they know that these two processes are going on at the same time and that they are going to affect each other. Mm -hmm. um, yes, I think maybe I do help, but sometimes, you know, people, as you folks know, <laughs> people's thoughts and ideas about the financial end of things are different than their kiddo end of things, and they might be doing quite well with the kiddo end of things, but not so much, you know, it's the financial right. end of things that are the triggers for them, not the kid. Right. Yeah. So I have had, I, I've called lots and lots of lawyers mm. and just said, come on, you guys help me out over here. Yeah. But, but kind of that teamwork, multidisciplinary aspect that you've talked about too. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, are you, do you have any plans to be cloned and, or do you have a mentee right now? Because <laughs> I feel like we need more parenting coordinators. To me, that's the only barrier in my mind at this point of not, 
um, getting this process to more families. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I just finished up with uh, my associate, um, Dr. Jason Jones. Um, he's a free man as of the start of this month. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, he stopped um, prior to um, getting involved in parenting coordination. Mm. Jason, come on. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, and um, that was, we had a five-year um, arrangement. Um, and the last part of that was supposed to be uh, his parenting coordination training and, and supervision and all of that. And he stopped before... He did this, and we actually ended our associate status together uh, a bit soon by agreement, which mm. I'm good with. But yeah, I'm, I'm actually um, I'm talking to two new associates right now, um, oh, good. and um, just to work in the area. And the parenting coordination is the most complex of the of the various areas that I work right. in. So um, those folks, if they come on board, won't be doing parenting coordination for um, a while. One of them is uh, a lawyer by training in a, another country. Oh, okay. Um, a psychologist here in Alberta, and I'm oh. very excited about that with her legal background. I think if she moves along uh, with me, she might move into this much faster than what I anticipate because of the, having her foot in both worlds. Um, and then the other person is... Uh, I think it says in my PowerPoint, so this is a job for at least a mid-career professional um, that's got a lot of training and background and maturity under their belt. I often thought my white beard and my bald head has stood me in good stead in terms of being the authority, uh, you know, <laughs> expert role that, that's absolutely necessary here with the high conflict folks um, as everybody here, I think, probably realizes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, we need more people. Um, there's a number of people in Edmonton that have taken the training. Um, they're all psychologists that I know, and they just, um, they just doesn't speak to them. Um, yeah. They um, are doing other things, and mm -hmm. um, it's, mm -hmm. yeah, we need more people working in i'm i'm getting inching towards retirement so well, um, heather lawyers can do it it's it might be a nice career segue for you okay okay i'll put that on the to-do list <laughs> <laughs> yeah and i'd be i'd love to um you know supervise lawyers as well mm. a lot of that until this moment really mm. in terms of the parent affordation piece mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. i wonder who, who is our guest as a divorce coach Kim McVeigh. Hey. Yeah, I thought it was Kim. I wonder. I wonder how interested she might be in in because it's not that. I mean, divorce coach. If you don't remember our listeners, she only acts for one side. It's not the same as doing the parenting coordination where you're kind of uh, the mediator type role. But and she's a lawyer, right? That's right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I didn't know she was doing that work, so that's great. Yeah, she does divorce coaching as well. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah, there might be, well, I don't know, I was going to say there might be people in the collaborative community in Edmonton that, that might be interested, but it's sort of different mm -hmm. as well, so I don't know. It's, we have the reputation as a bar, the family law bar, as being more litigious than Calgary, for example, who apparently has embraced a lot more easily arbitration and uh, alternative dispute resolution, so... I, I guess that's true since we only have two parenting coordinators apparently in the Edmonton area, but uh, Zoom works these days. What I was going to say is that, you know, this work can be done anywhere now in Alberta. Right. Um, any of the parenting coordinators that are right. you know, around. So Calgary's got a, a bigger pool. It doesn't have to be somebody from, from Edmonton. Yeah. I've got a, quite a few clients in rural Alberta and, um, I, I insist upon meeting them face to face at least for the first for the intake interview, and then after that, if we do Zoom, it's fine. But it's it's forming that relationship to, at the get go. I think it's so important. Plus, if they can drive in for Costco, they can drive in for Dr. Pickering. There you go. They can do it, they can do it on the same trip. Yeah. <laughs> on the other hand, you know Fort McMurray and Grand Prairie. I just talked to a friend. Who, who told me that 
they re- who lives in Fort McMurray, he says they regularly just do one day trips for Costco. They just seriously fly down, buy Costco, get a few, uh, you know, get those one dollar hot dog deals, and then uh, <laughs> and that's you know do their shopping, and then drive back same day. They come just for Costco. Well, that's dedication. Oh, there you go. Two for one if you do. <laughs> you do. Well, I, I've learned a lot. I really appreciate you uh, donating your time to come on here and share your your experience and background with us um, because I found it very val- uh, valuable. So thank you. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much for taking some time away from your, I know you're on a leisure time break right now. So extra thank you for that. And um yeah, I've learned so much. I know you're well respected and in high demand, and I think our listeners are very lucky to have an hour of uh, of your knowledge and information. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for having me. And yeah, I, I hope that it um, the listeners are learning something about it, about the whole parenting coordination. It's it's something that I I very much believe in. So yeah, your passion your passion for it shows for sure. So thank you so much. Yeah, good. Okay. Well, take care, everybody. All right. Well, this has been another episode of Access to Justice. Thanks for listening or watching however you found us today. If you have any questions you'd like us to address on the podcast, please send an email to Access to Justice Podcast. That's access number two justice podcast at gmail.com. And we'll do our best to get a new and answer on an upcoming episode. Thank you. Any information in this video is general information only and is not, nor is it intended to be, legal advice. Watching this video does not create a lawyer-client relationship. You should always seek the advice of a lawyer or other qualified professional for advice regarding your individual situation. While we take care to ensure that the information contained in this video is accurate and up-to-date, we make no warranties or representations as to the suitability, completeness, or accuracy of the information contained in this video. Any reliance you place on the information is at your own risk. Kahane Law Office, Merrick Law, Heather Mallory Professional Corporation, Evan Clark Professional Corporation, Evan Clark, Heather Mallory, and any guests will not be responsible nor liable in any way for any content, including but not limited to any errors or omissions in the content, or for any loss or damage of any kind incurred as a result of any content communicated in this video, whether by Evan Clark, Heather Mallory, or by a third party. Kim McDonald is a financial advisor with Raymond James Limited. Information provided is not a solicitation, and although obtained from sources considered reliable, is not guaranteed. The view and opinions contained in this media are those of Kim McDonald, not Raymond James Limited. Securities-related products and services are offered through Raymond James Limited, member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. Raymond James advisors are not tax advisors, and we recommend that clients seek independent advice from a professional advisor on tax-related matters. Insurance products and services are offered through Raymond James Financial Planning Limited, RJFE, a subsidiary of Raymond James Limited, which is not a member Canadian Investor Protection Fund. When providing life insurance products, financial advisors are acting as insurance representatives of RJFP. Darkness of the dales dissipates, declines because of he who turned water.